Hi, this is Heidi. Episode 43, lens number five, you are lazy. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello, friends. Happy June. How many of you are like me and just ecstatic? We made it to June. I'm recording this in May, but I have full confidence that we're all going to make it to June. March and April seemed like they were like 80 days long each month. Now, May, to me, seemed to go faster. Maybe it was the sunshine. Maybe we all had more to do in our days here in my house. I do hope you've been safe and well during this very unique time in our world. Recently, I've gotten together with friends sitting six feet apart, but in person, and it's been so awesome. We felt like our souls and spirits were renewed. We are social creatures, you guys. We need each other. Okay, thank you for rating and reviewing this podcast. I love hearing from you that these topics and especially these tools for cleaning your lenses are helping you. I was just telling a friend this week that I don't intend for this to be a parenting podcast. I don't want to be a parenting coach. I'm a confidence coach for mothers of teenagers, and that's because I have complete trust and confidence that you know what's best for your children. Everyone's situation is unique. What I do is best for me and my family, even with some missteps. My goal and mission is that you develop the clarity to see yourself and your world exactly as it is. And from there, with incredible confidence and self-love, you'll make the right and the best decisions for yourself and your family. Confidence doesn't look for validation from others. Confidence gathers information, researches, gets inspired, is surrounded by greatness, and then makes a decision knowing their worthiness and value are not on the line. It's great work, you guys. It's vulnerable work, and it's the best way to model how we want our children to feel and act as they grow and mature. So each of the four lenses that we've discussed have given you framework to analyze and gain awareness of where you have thoughts and beliefs and judgments that are clouding your vision of your teenager. And yes, these same tools are also useful for how we deal with any person in our life including ourselves. Okay, today's episode is about lens number five, which I've named You Are Lazy. A longer name is You Aren't Working Up to Your Potential. Now, do any of these sentences sound familiar? Have you said them to your child, to your spouse, to a friend when you're commiserating and trading parenting war stories? Why don't you work harder? You'd get higher grades if you'd apply yourself more you are giving up too easily. You can do so much more. This isn't your best. You're lazy. Other kids are applying themselves more and you aren't. Here's a good one. I worked so much harder when I was your age. I'm going to talk about that one specifically later in the episode. Now, all of these thoughts are not true thoughts, but they seem super real and true and something that like a court of law would totally rule on our side. But these are our opinions and judgments of our child. And since our thoughts create the emotions we feel and then act from, these thoughts create the disappointment and shame and judgment we feel towards our child. Now, I want to be clear here. Our child is not creating these emotions in us. The next time you feel disappointed, for example, stop and ask, what are you thinking? Not from a place of needing to change the emotion. Disappointment is a real emotion and you don't want to resist feeling it. Lots of you are disappointed this spring as you aren't throwing traditional graduation parties. You aren't watching spring sports or spring drama or music performances like before. Disappointment is the primary emotion a lot of us are feeling. Our kids are too. Our high school just sent out an email today that prom has been canceled. I'm sure there are lots of disappointed people. So allow them. Process them. Don't grab a chocolate chip cookie or a pint of ice cream to avoid them. That is buffering and it's only going to add negative to your life. Feel the disappointment and at the same time, notice what your thoughts are that are creating it. Your teen is not creating it. 
Their teachers aren't creating it. The virus isn't creating it. Your governor isn't creating it. You are. And the good news with accepting this responsibility is that you can create any emotion. The disappointment will pass. I promise it's going to pass a lot quicker than you think. It's very important in all of this work with every lens that you start to assume the responsibility of every emotion in your body. You will show up very different, more confident, more in control with your children and with everyone when you've realized this is how your emotions work. Okay, so back to our children and their potential. Guys, I'm with you. It seems so real and true to see them and think, you can do so much more. If only they studied more. If only they turned in work on time. If only on and on. All of those thoughts and the underlying problem with this lens is our focus on the negative. Our focus on some perceived gap. Us focusing on the half missing from the cup, not the half in the cup. No example shows this better than that of looking at our child's grades. I have to consciously change my focus and practice looking and commenting on the positive, not the negative. You know what you do. You look at their grades online. Your eyes immediately zoom into the low scores, the low grades, almost not even being aware of the high and the things that are positive there. The low scores or missing work is what you comment on to your child because that's where your focus is. And our brains think that we should focus here because it wants to protect us from any danger or future pain. So we ask our child, why didn't you turn in this work? This is your grade. Why isn't it higher? Didn't you study for that quiz? If you just worked harder, you'd have an A, not a B. Or you'd have a B, not a C, whatever it is. You got a 75 on a test. Why not higher? Notice our brains don't stop and appreciate and honor the high without us making them take note. It takes effort. It takes awareness. It takes us consciously wanting to see good so that we can praise our child before focusing on what's missing or the gaps. Also, see how when we're focusing on the low scores, we are making up what we don't actually know to be true. We're creating stories about their potential and what they could do if they put their mind to it. We think we know exactly where our child came up before reaching their potential. We think we know exactly what our child could achieve if they were more dedicated. And I get it. It feels really helpful for us to push them and encourage them from this energy and perspective. It feels like this is what quote, good moms do. We push them to be the best they can be. And all of that actually can be useful and our children can learn and grow from all of our encouragement. But there's a difference between doing that from positive versus negative energy. When this lens is clear and we drop the name calling and shaming of the you are lazy comments, we project much more confidence and we do our work to stay in our lane, to own our results and self-confidence, our self-esteem, and we allow our children to really show us what they can do. We are set up to think we should know what our child can achieve. Think about the doctor's visits when they were younger and how a doctor can almost predict the height potential of a child by doubling their height when they were two years old. Now, some think this is accurate. I never asked my doctor and they didn't offer, but we have these predictors given to us at earlier stages. So we think we can guess what our child's potential is in less tangible or measurable ways than height. And side note, would anyone criticize or belittle a child who stopped growing or was a foot shorter than their peers? No amount of shaming or name calling or motivating will make them grow taller. We accept people with different shapes and sizes, but we're less accepting of other differences. So picture the child you think is the laziest or not working up to their potential. Why do you think you know exactly what they're capable of right now? Make your brain really answer this. How is it true that you don't know if the 55 on their physics test really was their best? Now write it down. You aren't right or wrong, but you need to see that it's possible that you don't know what they're capable of right now. 
And just like seeing one child taller than another, we think we know our child's potential because we compare them to other children. And comparison always brings us compare despair. Comparison only makes us focus on what our child is missing. And if we do the comparing to falsely feel better or prideful, we are seeking all the wrong things. This is not a foundation for our own confidence or our child's confidence. So watch for the comparison. It's easy to do. Bring yourself back by telling yourself, I don't know what another child is doing or what their potential is. My child is doing their best. My child has so many strengths. When we hyper-focus and compare our kids to another, we end up saying things to our children that totally reveal to them that we're comparing them and we think they're coming up short. Our kids know this. They feel it. They already, in their minds, compare themselves. They don't need us layering our own comparison on top of their own. Remember, our children want our praise and love and acceptance more than anyone else's acceptance. These comments chip away at the trust and confidence safety net that we're trying to provide them in these years. Now, back to questioning your child's potential. Let's say your child who has started smoking pot or you know that they've been drinking alcohol this year, their grades have dropped. How do you know this isn't their best for this year of their life? Write it down. We want them to be doing something different. We see with our adult wisdom and lenses that these are bad choices, but there's something about this behavior revealing something about their life to us right now. Our focusing on them not behaving at their potential is actually shielding us from asking deeper and more important questions. What is going on for this child right now? What am I not seeing that would be much more useful? Answering those questions puts us in very different energy to deal with the drugs or drinking or other issues. Of course, we address them, but we say and do different things when we're setting limits and consequences from love versus control and insecurity. Our American culture is very productivity focused. We're all about the hustle. We are hard workers. We want our children to be the same way. When we push our kids to always be part of these productivity wars or comparison, we inadvertently model to them that exterior or visible products are more important than internal and less visible achievements. Yes, it seems like our child is lazy by sleeping until noon, but a lot of research shows our teens' brains and biorhythms are designed to stay up late and sleep late into the day, especially during this quarantine I told myself every day my child's job was to get enough sleep. Yes, they had to get their work done, but I told myself that sleep was part of the job. It is so helpful to be aware of exactly what's going on in their brain. Research now shows that their brains are not fully developed, especially the prefrontal cortex, until maybe ages 25 or 27. The more understanding we have of this means we're going to be much more compassionate for all of their shortcomings right now as teenagers. Knowing this has been a game changer for me and how I talk to my kids. I'm constantly reminding myself they are going to get this when the time is right. This is going to all come together. I can teach them things, but some things just take time for all of the puzzle pieces to come together. The book, The Teenage Brain by Francis Jensen and Amy Nutt has been so helpful to me to get a better sense of exactly what's going on in their heads. And even so, all three of my children are completely different. Their brains are all different. Even with a neuroscientist expertise, I still have to honor that they're all unique and I don't totally know what their potential is right now. This year, this grade, with all of the factors in their life, some of which I'm not even aware of. Just thinking that over and over, I don't know exactly what their potential is, moves me from judgment and into curiosity, a much more useful emotion. And guys, 
as parents, we have terrible memories of what we did or didn't do as teens. Even if you think you can remember in a balanced sense the good and the bad of your teen years, we do not remember accurately. And we just can't compare our youth to the world today. It's not a fair comparison. Telling them that they aren't working as hard as you did doesn't build their sense of worthiness or value. No one, children or adults, ever wants to improve from a sense of shame. We only seek to improve when we feel worthy and valuable and love ourselves enough to think we can do more. Let me give you a great example of this and what I think a lot of us want to be for our children. Last spring, my son Matthew was in ninth grade and on the JV lacrosse team. He had been on the team for two years and he set the goal to work incredibly hard and train as if there was a chance he could be asked to come and play for varsity. He set awesome mental and physical goals. And one reason he did this was because he really respects the coach. The coach demands a lot from them. And somehow Matthew clicked with really wanting to do what the coach wanted and to impress him. He didn't miss a single workout. He isn't the fastest, but no one could have been more committed. Towards the end of the season, the varsity team made division playoffs. And the coach told the JV team that he would be picking a few kids to suit up and go to the varsity games. Matthew doubled down on commitment. On Sunday night, he got an email that he was asked to suit up and be with varsity. I still remember where I was when he came into my room on Sunday night and he said, guess what, mom? I got the email. The coach asked me to suit up for the varsity game. The smile on his face was more than ear to ear. He was beaming with pride. And then he said a little softly, maybe not realizing he was saying it out loud. He said, I'm so glad he sees potential in me. Imagine that. I'm so glad he sees potential in me. My son's greatest desire was to work hard to show the coach the potential, and the coach saw it. I will never forget it. I'm incredibly grateful for coaches and teachers who see my children's potential, who nurture and feed the positive and encourage and praise and build up instead of tearing down. And one reason this meant so much to my son was that he knows the coach has high standards, but my son also knew he'd get rewarded for the hard, consistent work. I'm so glad he sees potential in me. He said it out loud, but all of our children are starving for role models to see their potential. They're looking for signals in the world that they have potential. Their still growing brains don't know what they can do. Just like the coach calling some kids from JV to go to varsity, there are things we can do to signal to our children that we see potential in them. But we can't do it when we're focused on what they're lacking. When we focus on seeing our children exactly as they are, and this is the harder part, accepting and loving them right where they are, we start reinforcing the half full cup. We feed their brains the positive thoughts and self-love to add to their inner dialogue. When we stop comparing them or calling them lazy, we suddenly can see areas where they are doing amazing. We suddenly see where they're silently achieving and performing exactly what they should be at this age. We don't like it when people call us lazy. Why would they like it? Our kids also need unstructured time to just explore, create, be themselves without the need to be productive. My daughter learned so much at a sewing class where the last part of the class was just free sewing. They could sew whatever they wanted with whatever materials, no patterns, no direction. If we let our children have more freedom in choosing to spend time on their interests, we might see them flourish in areas of competency we hadn't even known were within them. By widening the lens through which we see them, we might discover their potential is greater than we can even imagine. But we want to do this from a place of loving them now and wanting them to grow. We don't want them to think that they need to do this so that we can love them more or they can become more worthy. Our kids know the difference if they have to achieve to earn our love. And I'm sure you're very productive and a hardworking person. Our American culture 
doesn't really value relaxation and a slower pace like other cultures do. Almost two years ago, we went to Paris and as typical tourists, we were hustling from place to place. I can't wait to go back to really enjoy a three hour lunch. I need to do more of that now. Model to your teen what self-care looks like. What does building relationships and giving service to others look like? Make sure they see you filling your bucket just as much as they see you working. They'll be more willing to work with us if we find ways to relax and play together. And if you get sick, rest, get well. It isn't lazy to take care of yourself until you're better. This is loving yourself. Our kids need to see us do this. Hustling isn't self-love. No one has on their tombstone that they wish they had worked or hustled more. One of my children is very chill, very laid back. It can sometimes look like being lazy, but when I take off my judgment classes and clear up this lazy lens, I suddenly see all the ways that they are working very hard, how I'm so glad that they are the way they are. I see the benefits to them and how they're so pleasant to be around. The best work I've done is to accept them exactly as they are and not make anything wrong or bad about them. If I didn't say it enough earlier, praise, praise, praise your children. Show them that you value effort. Hold them to high standards and give them reasons to want to meet those standards. Our children want to be with people who make them feel better, who see the good in them, who strengthen their own self-worth. And when you believe in your own capabilities and you speak positively about yourself, you are showing your children what it looks like to trust intuition for their capabilities. Show them that you love yourself regardless of your successes or failures. And you might need to clean up lens number four of perfectionism here. One of the emotions we sometimes feel when lens five is cloudy is shame. Before I close, I want to just say something about shame. If this is an emotion you feel regularly, this is your work to do. This isn't your child's work. Shame is a sign of a few things. First, it shows that you don't fully understand your worth and value. Work on loving yourself unconditionally. Second, we often feel shame when we're worried about what other people are going to think of us or what they might think of us if our child does this or that. Do other people judge us if our child does X, Y, or Z? Shame is a sign that you're in other people's heads way too much. You care what they think more than caring about what you think. And you'll always be looking for outer validation. And let me tell you, outer validation is never enough to fill an inner void. This is your work to do. This isn't where your child needs to work harder or perform better or whatever. When your child does something different or better or whatever, that's their result. This is because of their potential, their thoughts, their own development on their path. Your job is to love them, accept them, provide the structure, encouragement, and rules and consequences that you see fit, but that's it. We get to love ourselves and know we're good. Well, actually great and amazing parents, no matter what our children choose to do. Yes, we can be disappointed or sad at times, but only because of our thoughts. Our child is not responsible for our emotions and they are not responsible to fill our self-worth bucket. That is our job. And I promise you, there is more than enough evidence in your life for you to see that you are doing a great job. You're doing so much better than you realize. Your child wants you to think that about yourself. When we love ourselves, we have so much more love to give others. It's really as simple and as hard as that. If you're ready to do this life-changing work of clearing off the lens that is the dirtiest for you and replace them with a unique prescription for your own situation for you and for your children, set up a free consult call at my website, HeidiBenjaminson.com. Get the free workbook to start the work by taking the confidence quiz on my website. This will give you a framework to start clearing off the lenses. I promise you, if you do the work, you'll have so much more control over your emotions. You'll be able to stay off the teenage emotional roller coaster. Or at least when you catch yourself putting one foot on it, you'll be aware and you'll know how to get off of it. 
Like one of my clients just said to me, calm feels so good. It really requires someone outside of us, helping us see our brains, showing us that there is another way to think and to see ourselves and our children. Just like putting on new glasses, we don't know what we don't know until we're given another option. And that is what I do. I hope you have a great week. Stay healthy, safe, and go love on yourselves and your kids.